The subject of this next panel is broadly defined as non-banks, uh, or beyond the banks. The, um, the groupings of these things is uh, a little bit arbitrary. So um, non-banks includes Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, AIG, money market funds, and the auto companies for some reason. Um, because they had to go somewhere and we didn't want to leave them out. Uh, uh, we have a particularly good panel to discuss uh, what was one, some of the most consequential decisions of the crisis and s ones that may be with us for some time. Um, our lead speaker is going to be Bill Dudley, who is the former uh, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And then I'm joined by Scott Alvarez, who was the general counsel at the Federal Reserve Board, I think forever until recently. Is that right? <laughs> right. I was born at the Federal Reserve <laughs> And Steve Schaffrin, um, who was one of those people who was in the private sector and had the misfortune to have Hank Paulson know his phone number. Uh, and so was instrumental. Uh, you were in both administrations, right? Uh, in both the uh, Bush and Obama administrations. Bill's going to kick this off, and then we'll turn to questions. OK, thank you. Um, so first of all, I want to just thank uh, Nellie Lang and, and Scott Alvarez for all the work they did on this paper. I, I, they, they deserve the credit. Uh, for the paper on the non-bank financial sector. Uh, that said, as always, I have to issue my usual disclaimer. My comments today reflect my own views and not those of the Federal Reserve System. I'm, st I'm on garden leave, so I still have a few, few weeks. <laughs> um, and I'm also going to apologize. I'm only going to speak for a couple minutes, so there's a lot of stuff I'm going to leave out. So if you, if you don't hear it mentioned, it's not my fault. Uh, I'm going to focus my remarks on answering three questions. First, why was the non-bank sector so important as, as part of the financial crisis? Uh, second, what were the primary factors that drove the Fed's and the U.S. Treasury decisions with respect to uh, Bear Stearns, uh, Lehman, and AIG? And then third, what lessons should we take away from the financial crisis with respect to the non-bank sector? In particular, are we in, in a better place today uh, than we were 10 years ago with respect to regulatory oversight and the tools we have available to use the next uh, to, 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 for the next time when we encounter a period of financial instability. So turning to the first question, I think what's different about this, about the financial crisis, was that the non-bank sector really played a key role. And the question is, why was that? As I see it, there were four important factors behind that. The first is that the securities industry, mortgage banking, finance companies, and, and the GSEs all grew very, very rapidly uh, starting in the 1980s. And they, and, they, and they grew to play a very significant role in the intermediation of credit in the U.S. economy. And that was due to many factors, but I think the most important one was the development of securitization and structured finance. Uh, that really facilitated the originate and distribute model, and that led to the development of global capital markets in which the securities firms were really able to compete effectively with commercial banks. So prior to the 1990s, we had investment banks that were tended to be private partnerships with very small balance sheets. And during that period, a major investment bank could fail. Think of Drexel Burnham failure in 1990. But the failure would typically not be systemic. In contrast, by the time of the financial crisis, we had very large investment banks who were global, uh, very leveraged, and were dependent on wholesale funding to fund assets that were often either hard to value, think CDOs, or liquid, think commercial real estate. Second thing that was important was that the regulatory regime did not keep pace with these changes in the structure of the financial system. Uh, the focus of security regulators, both federal and state, was primarily on investor protection, not on financial stability or the safety and soundness of the firms that they regulated. Uh, in particular, the potential standards with respect to liquidity and capital for securities firms were either very weak or, or non-existent. Third issue was that the central bank's authority to provide a lender of last resort backstop to non-banks was very limited. Uh, we've talked a lot already about Section 13.3, only can be used in unusual and exigent circumstances. The credit can only be extended if it's determined that the credit's not available from a, another source. So that means that the credit from a central bank to the non-bank financial sector can only be forthcoming only after circumstances have become very dire. So as a result of that, counterparties to securities firms could have very little confidence about when or whether a central bank was actually going to be willing to provide liquidity, which made runs much more likely. And then finally, there was no good resolution regime in place for large systemic non-banking firms. Uh, as we saw in the case of Lehman, the bankruptcy path turned out to be particularly problematic. Uh, 
because it spurred a run on the money market mutual funds, which we'll, we'll touch on. Uh, and, and it led to the abrupt closeout of trillions of dollars of OTC derivatives contracts, which, which turned out to be uh, very damaging. And it also raised questions about the viability of the other global securities firms that were still uh, in business. So as we were st stood on the eve of the financial crisis, the non-bank sector was very fragile. And so when the housing bubble burst and home prices declined, we knew that the stress on this, on this sector was going to increase. And as it increased, there was very little in the toolkit that the regulatory authorities had to respond as, as the circumstances deteriorated. Uh, and I think that made it just much more difficult to arrest the downward dynamic and to restore confidence. So in 2008, when we're faced with the eminent failures of Bear Stearns, Lehman, and AIG in short order, policymakers were faced with an important question. How far could they go in stretching the available tools, which were clearly inadequate, to limit contagion and constrain uh, an, an ever-broadening financial crisis? So this turns to the second set of issues. So in determining whether to intervene, I think policymakers wrestled mainly with three major questions. The first was, would the failure of the institution likely cause material harm to the core of the financial system and to the overall economy? So if the, if the firm failed, what would, what would, would be the consequences? The second is, would a broader provision of liquidity to markets and other firms likely be sufficient to mitigate the effects of such a firm's failure? Could you provide broad-based liquidity, the firm fails, life goes on, it's not systemic? And the third is, could lending to the firm be sufficient to prevent its failure? Now, these are all questions that require judgment and certainly depend on the particular set of circumstances in place at the time that the judgment needs to ma be made. Suffice it to say, in the case of Bear Stearns and AIG, the answer to all three questions was judged to be yes. A failure would likely damage the core financial system and the economy. The provision of liquidity to the rest of the financial system would unlikely be powerful enough by itself to sufficiently limit the damage. And the firms were judged as still likely to be viable. Bear Stearns had a willing acquisition partner in the form of J.P. Morgan. And AIG, as we know, had major insurance subsidiaries that could be sold or that would, over time, provide support to the parent holding company. In contrast, for Lehman, the answer to the third question was judged to be no. Although Lehman might possibly be, have been judged as solvent on a book value basis in September 2008, the fact is that many of its assets were carried on the books at inflated valuations, and the firm's franchise was rapidly eroding. Moreover, I think it's important to recognize that Lehman failed an important market test. It was unable to raise capital on its own, and no acquirer was able to step forward on a timely basis and acquire Lehman, even with a large chunk of its more liquid impaired assets uh, being removed from its balance sheet. So this brings us to the third question. So where do we stand today with respect to the non-bank financial sector? And what are the lessons we should have learned from the financial crisis? So as I look at it, today there are both positives and negatives. On the positive side of the ledger, all the major investment banks now are either part of bank holding companies or foreign banking organizations, and thus they're subject to capital and liquidity regulation, and they're subject to supervision that focuses on good governance, risk management, and safety and soundness. So that's a very different situation than we were in, in 2007. On the positive side, the Dodd-Frank Act does provide the authority for the Financial Stability Oversight Council to designate firms uh, and activities to a more limited extent as systemic and subject to prudential regulation. So in principle, if new firms and activities were to emerge that were systemic, the regulatory safety net could be, the regulatory perimeter could be adjusted uh, as needed. So there's potentially the ability. However, I am very skeptical about this, about whether this will actually be ever used in a timely way. I think it's always going to be late. Uh, the third thing that's good is the Dodd-Frank Act does provide a means for a resolution of a complex systemic financial institution outside of bank bankruptcy, and that's contained in the orderly liquidation authority of Title II of Dodd-Frank. And some of the more major structural weaknesses that I think made the securities industry even more vulnerable have been addressed, and that includes reforms to the money market mutual fund industry and the reforms that we've done to tri-party tri repo system. On the negative side, well, there's this issue, will the FSEC act in a timely way? But there's also the issue of the, the fact that there's no lender last resort available for non-bank financial firms except in extremis, and the fact that the Fed's Section 13.3 authority has been uh, constrained, as the Fed can no longer lend to a single firm 
under Section 13.3. That basically rules out the type of interventions that were undertaken in the case of Bear Stearns and AIG. Um, I, like I think many other people who have worked on, on these papers would like to move in the opposite direction to have a system similar to what we actually have for commercial banks. Have a lender last resort available as a normal course of business, not an extremis, to systemic non-bank financial firms with an explicit quid pro quo. To get this, you have to be subject to appropriate prudential regulation and supervision. Uh, I have to say I'm disappointed that not only do we not have this, it's not even being seriously debated. So what are the lessons learned? Well, the most important lesson from my perspective by far is that the regulatory regime has to keep up with the evolving financial system. And that's really going to be the challenge for the next generation. It's, I don't know. I, I, I think this is one where you're probably going to fail <laughs> again and again, but that's the challenge. Other key lessons include that in a crisis, you have to have the ability to act aggressively to get in front of the crisis to contain panics and limit contagion. So to do that, the, the authorities need the legal, uh, the authorities need the legal tools to be able to implement such actions in a timely way. Uh, the second lesson, I think, is that regulators do have to practice how they would coordinate their act actions during time of crisis. Who's responsible for what? And is there a common understanding concerning responsibilities both nationally and on a cross-border basis. I think one er area that isn't buttoned up enough is how we handle things when a global firm uh, goes under. And third, third lesson is when asset quality is deter deteriorating, there is no good substitute for capital. Liquidity and a lender last resort backstop are necessary, but they're not sufficient. When the private sector is unwilling or una un unable to supply capital, the government may have to step forward. Uh, in my opinion, in the fall of 2008, the public capital brought forth by the TARP le legislation was an essential ingredient for ending the crisis. But as we saw, the situation first had to get really, really bad for Congress to be willing to enact that legislation. And I think this underscores an important point that we may, may want to debate further. Even if Lehman had somehow been saved, the crisis would have continued. Other parts of the financial system would have broken until Congress acted and the public capital necessary to bolster the financial system become available. People have this notion that somehow if Lehman had been saved, everything would have been fine. No, the stress level would have continued, other things would have broken until Congress acted and enacted uh, TARP. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bill. Um, maybe Steve and Scott, I can ask, I have some specific questions, but can, we, can I ask your reactions to the big question that Bill posed, which is essentially, are, in what ways are we better off and in what ways are we not better off when you think about the growth of the finance outside of banks? So there, I think that there are, yeah. I think there are definitely, as Bill pointed out, some ways that we are, we are better off. We have a resolution regime for not large uh, financial firms that we did not have before. And I think that's a very powerful tool. Um, it's a, in some ways meant to be a substitute for the constraints on 13.3 uh, so that the Fed can't lend uh, to those firms, but we can put them in resolution. That's a way to punish shareholders a little bit more, punish management a little bit more, but also keep an eye, uh, an eye on financial stability in the process of resolving the firm. Uh, I think there, while that's a powerful tool, and I think in some ways uh, the liquidity and capital that might be needed for a large financial firm could come out of a resolution, uh, it's a pretty unwieldy tool as well. So um, I, I wonder if um, how that would work if Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, AIG, Wachovia were all failing at the same time. Would the government be able to put all of them in resolution uh, and manage that at the same time? So in that respect, I think the loss of uh, a Fed uh, lender of last resort authority is is perhaps a mistake because it is quicker and easier to provide some liquidity in an emergency than to stand up and manage uh, a resolution. So I think the two tools would work better if they were both in place. We have the one, we're better off with res with having resolution, but there's a minus in losing the, the Fed lending authority. Um, one place where I think we're better off is um, the Fed Lending Authority continues to exist and has sort of been ex accentuated uh, in lending to um, central uh, clearing uh, uh, you know, financial market utilities 
Uh, and I think that is actually going to turn out to be useful in the future. We've designed our system now in a way where there's going to be more clearing and there's going to be more interconnection between the largest firms in derivatives and swaps and other kinds of uh, uh, instruments. And so those uh, central counterparties become a node of, um, of risk and potential contagion. And I think the fact that the, the Congress has preserved the authority of the Fed to lend to them is a really useful uh, useful tool. Um, obviously, losing uh, uh, you know the ESF is uh, uh, not a plus. The Exchange Stabilization Exchange Fund that was used for the money fund market funds. Treasury. That's right, um, because that had such a potential for use by the Treasury, um, and and so that leaves the Treasury, I think, with uh, two arms tied behind their back instead of just one. Um, so uh, I do one other tool I think that is very useful is not so much a, a post-crisis tool, but a pre-crisis tool. I think the additions to resilience, uh, a supervisory authority, the focus on financial stability as a focus for regulators uh, is a really important thing. We've had a lot of discussion today about the need for capital. And to the extent that uh, the regulators are in a better position to both supervise and require capital on a broader range to the financial system, including non-banks. I think that's a, that's a positive. Are you, confident that if, are you confident that if the authorities lent to a central clearinghouse that Congress wouldn't react in horror and close that off? So, uh, you know, it, it, it worries me that, you know, the Federal Reserve lent and was repaid fully with interest on all of its loans, and Congress rewarded the Fed by taking away their authority. I think that's always a risk. On the other hand, um, you, it's an important tool, and it's, we're better off with that tool, and you have to use the tools that you have and deal with the consequences later on. Steve? I... I came to this as a fixer, not as a policymaker, so I'll, I'll sort of stay in my lane. Um, I look at the world I've participated in the last 10 years, and I can't help but think about the are we fighting the last war element of this whole conversation. Um, what we see in the economy and what's happening in sort of the forefront of our industry is essentially uh, the, I don't know, it's the last act, but a, a major ongoing act in the disintermediation of what banks do. And we look at all these really cool companies that interface with consumers and take deposits now that aren't banks. And we look at all these really cool companies that, that make loans to, to individuals and corporations that aren't banks. And if we roll that clock forward 5, 10, 15 years, the trend lines were on, two things come out of that phenomenon. One is that I think those institutions get bigger, more powerful, more important. And two, they lessen the importance and significance of the banks that we've spent so much time thinking about and creating a regulatory environment for. So when we wake up in the world, the next time that there's a problem, uh, the, the non -bank, these non-bank institutions that uh, are essentially intermediating savings into investment and so forth, none of this that were, none of the things that we did and will, will be, I, I don't know that it'll be effective in, in, in uh, assisting those institutions, and I do think those institutions are gonna really hollow out our, our traditional banks that we spend so much time regulating and worrying about. The other thing that sort of depresses me a bit uh, is somehow or another we participated, that, that there's a, there was never any confidence, at least not a lot of confidence in us as decision makers uh, by the, on the part of the people who have the money uh, on the Hill. And that feels, more true today than it did 10 years ago, and it was pretty tough 10 years ago. And so I think about the need, like, again, the, the money market fund guarantee, which we can talk about, but the ability to use the ESF on the turn on a dime and, and, and do that and affect positive change, clearly that was a bad thing because we, we, we said we shouldn't do that again. And so uh, our successors will just have that many fewer tools and I think be that much hampered and, and we will all be in that much more danger. Uh, which turns me to my last point, which is I, after I, I left the government and spent some time teaching at Georgetown, I, I sort of learned what everybody who's been doing this for a living knew, which is whenever you have deposit taking institutions and they don't have access to a lender of last resort, bad things will happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that simple. And, and the money market funds 
were, I think, the, the best, uh, somebody called them the, the dry tinder on the desert, on the, uh, on the forest floor. Uh, they continue to be uh, effectively that. And, uh, and the fact that we went through the crisis we went through and we saw how much danger and how close they brought us to really serious problems and we've effectively left them as they were, you know, more or less, just startles me. And uh, I would expect more trouble from this sector in the future when there's a liquidity run. I was feeling pretty optimistic this morning when I heard that <laughs> we only have financial crises every 75 years, and I'm 64 years old, so I figured I'm safe. Uh, unfortunately, my optimism has been completely dispelled in the last 20 minutes, um, so the bar will be open soon. Um, uh, but So on this regulatory perimeter thing, so I thought the idea was that the FSOC was going to have the power to decide when institutions that were might not seem systemically important today become systemically important that they could be designated. That was clearly the idea. Um, it seems to me that that's been basically completely gutted. The combination of the, the lawsuits uh, from the insurance companies and the current attitude of the FSOC, and it seems to me that we, we basically have defanged that tool. Is, do you agree or not? Well, I mean, I think it comes back to what I said originally. I, we have the tool. The question is, will that tool be actually used in a timely way? And the answer and, is? And, and I think the answer is probably not. I mean, you know, one, one thing that's been a thread going through all these conversations is the political economy is much worse today than it was 10 years ago in terms of what you can actually do. Like, could you do TARP legislation again? If you did TARP legislation again, could you actually put the money uh, capital into the banks? Would the banks actually be willing to take the capital? I mean, the, there's a lot of political economy elements that I think have gone very much in the, in the wrong direction. And I think an interesting question is, what can uh, we do to sort of push against that? Well, the other thing was the, the FSOC was designed, again, to fight the last war. There were institutions that weren't in the system. We could name them. We had one or two hands to get them all. Well okay, those institutions aren't there or they may not be the problem. What if it's an entire industry? That's not what the FSOC is set up to do. And I, and I, I say that, you know, when we, when we think about private lending or private deposit taking. And uh, the FSOC is not a tool to take so, that on. So, Steve, you, you suggested that we haven't done enough on the money market funds. What, what is it that... Well, let me start. Did, did you anticipate, did anybody anticipate the money market fund problem would follow? Lehman? Scott, did you want to weigh in? I'm sorry. I wanted to weigh in on the last crisis. Please. Last crisis. crisis. <laughs> That's what we're doing today, weighing in on the last crisis. <laughs> but uh, So I think there is one really cool aspect of um, FSOC, and that's it. I think in the 1930s, um, Congress couldn't have predicted what the next part of the financial system would be that would cause trouble. And the idea of the FSOC was, you know, you've got, a, you've got an agency that's keeping a broader eye on the market developments and can be nimble and can move the regulatory um, uh, framework as it needs to to handle the developments in the market. And I think that's, that's actually cooler than having Congress try to do that all the time because it's very difficult to get new laws passed. On the other hand, I, for the reasons Bill mentioned, um, I think it's, it's unlikely that it's going to work soon enough to make it useful because it doesn't help to designate someone right before a crisis. You have to designate them far enough in advance that you can do something about it. Um, and so I actually really like, um, or at least would want to think more about Bill's idea that uh, another way to approach this is to have some emergency tools like a um, uh, discount window facility that's open to financial institutions, but on conditions they agree to some supervisory uh, framework. And that, uh, you know, there, that provides an incentive for firms um, to, to think about where they might be in a crisis and what kind of help they might need in a crisis and prepare for it in advance. So there are other ideas out there that are, add the nimbleness of FSOC. I, I don't want to be entirely negative so that you don't have to rush off to the bar. I think there are other, other uh, solutions to think about. So I can see that Geithner is clearly having uh, influence here. Uh, the former general counsel of the Federal Reserve used the word cooler twice <laughs> in I, reference to a, a, an Tim, element I've of... I've been using it a lot Frank. longer. <laughs> Steve, um, so f on the money market funds, first of all, was this a surprise that Lehman was followed by breaking the bucket uh, 
the primary reserve fund or the reserve primary fund, whatever it is. And then, oh, so let's start with that. Did, did, was this one of those unforeseen? Unforeseen. Uh, it's kind of alarming. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> okay. I mean, <laughs> Just the, 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 the check and I, uh, uh, around sort of the markets knowing best, you know, I think we spent much of the summer after Bear assuring ourselves that, well, everybody knows Lehman's next. Everybody knows they're in trouble. Surely all their trading partners are buttoned up. Everybody's adequately collateralized. There's no way anything bad could happen. Right. Not anything, but that, that we thought that the markets had sort of self-corrected and were, and were taking things into account over the course of the summer. That turned out to be less true than we thought. Um, so I think we knew it was going to be bad. I mean, it just was yeah, worse than yeah. that. Right. I mean, I thought, um, for people who haven't read it, um, Tim Geithner and Andrew Metrick have a kind of Socratic dialogue on the Yale website about Lehman Brothers. And I thought one of the most uh, useful admissions that Geithner makes is, we knew it would be bad, but it was worse than we expected, which I, sounds has the ring of honesty to it. Um, but Steve, we haven't done enough for money market funds. We, like, they're all, all the... A lot of the, well, there's been a number of, with a great deal of struggle, the FSOC and the SEC put some new rules in place. There's now less money in the prime funds, which invest in corporate paper, and more money in the funds that invest in government securities, but you're not satisfied. I just think the concept of, of having deposit-taking institutions, not having access to a lender of last resort, is profoundly risky. And with all due respect to the wisdom of the institutions and their desire to mitigate risk and to do the right thing. You know, in the middle of the financial crisis, the vast majority of the money market fund owners told us, we don't want insurance. We don't need it. You're ruining our industry. And, and, and so the idea that they are going to, before the fact, sign up to some sort of government insurance program with attendant regulation on a voluntary basis, I think is uh, not as fanciful. Um, the, the, the behavior in the middle of the crisis, I think, is, is really instructive. I think the, the money market funds, the industry itself, uh, was convinced that they brought no danger to the system, that they were prudently managed, that they uh, had done everything they were supposed to do and weren't a risk. Um, and I think we were 24, 48 hours from Armageddon because of that position. And so I, I uh, think it's, this is again one of those cases where the FSOC, it's not that there was any one particular money market fund that was a problem. It was having a, uh, a patch of real estate occupied by a series of industry participants that collectively created this risk. Um, and we basically are still, still at risk. Yes. Do you guys agree? I think still at risk, probably a little bit less risk in the sense that you know you have a floating NAV for the institutional prime funds, which I think is an important difference because you don't have the incentive to get there first, and the fact that the prime funds are much smaller. So still, still a risk, but it's, it's, I, I think at least we moved in the right direction. Uh, Scott, one of the I don't want to litigate the entire Lehman thing in the time we have. Um, <laughs> Well, actually, I'd like to, but I'm not going to. <laughs> but there are two things that have been raised, and I'm sort of curious, because uh, they're both legal issues, or in part legal issues. One is, what, or, and Bill, you as well, what difference does it make if somebody becomes a bank holding company? Lehman, you, in your paper, you say you considered making investment banks, bank holding companies in June, decided not to do it. After Lehman fails, you allow Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley to become bank holding companies. Um, a, does it? What difference does it make? And B, what are the criteria that the Fed use? Is it judgment or legal to decide whether a firm can become a bank holding company? So let me t let me take the uh, the sort of the, the market sense, and I'll turn it to Scott for the for the legal aspect of it. <coughs> Look, I think I think our judgment was that it wouldn't really do very much substantively because you still have all the 23A uh, restrictions on lending. You can't lend to the securities sub of a bank holding company. Uh, so Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs were still going to have these very large securities firms that, that the Fed couldn't lend to. But it would be in some way an endorsement of the firms to, that, that, that the Fed is thinking that they're viable. That's why they're letting them become bank holding companies. And uh, 
coupled with the fact that we wanted Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley to go out and raise private capital. It's the combination of those two things that we thought were successful, would be, would be helpful. So it's not that we thought that making them bank holding companies was all of a sudden going to save the day, but if they became bank holding companies and they went out and raised outside capital, which both Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs did, we thought in combination that would make people in the marketplace feel that they had a viable business, viable business model, and that they would be able to survive. And even that said, it was a very close thing, especially for Morgan Stanley. It was a very close thing. Scott? Yeah, so uh, Bill's got it exactly right. On From a legal side, there was no difference. They got no greater access to the discount window by becoming a bank holding company. They got no special privileges by being a bank holding company. Uh, it, it was, I think, as, as Bill said, the imprimatur of the Federal Reserve had some value to it, that somebody in the middle of the crisis when nobody knew what the real strength of an organization was, some independent group with, with quality analysis and standards evaluated the balance sheet and the financial resources from the government and then from the private sector. And both of them agreed that these are companies that uh, met some minimum standards at a time when everybody was uncertain about it. And I, I think that was the best value that it had. Um, but clearly, the, without the private capital, uh, I, I don't know that it would have worked as a, as a device. Yeah. So, but the 23A, this rule that you, the Fed can't lend to the broker, you waived that for Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs. So that can't have been. So not exactly. Uh, so 23A limits the funding that can come from the bank to the non-bank side. What the Fed waived was, uh, uh, so it applies not just to loans or funding that goes through, but purchase of assets. And what the, what the Fed did was allow the bank to purchase assets from the non-banking side of uh, of Goldman and Morgan Stanley that could have been originated by the banks to start with. So, you know, it was a way of getting some funding through, but if you were looking for a door to provide strong amount of liquidity to the broker dealer, the it would be it would be tough um, to, to Okay, in the paper you say that you refer to, to become a bank holding company, you have to demonstrate sufficient financial and managerial resources to meet regulatory and supervisory requirements and to safely and soundly continue operations. Is that a legal standard, or is that just the, the, what the practice of the Federal Reserve System is? No, that's is? a statutory standard. I see. Okay. All right, second question for you, uh, Scott and Bill. I'll get to you in a minute. I'm not going to let you off the hook. Um, so a lot of the question about Lehman has to do with collateral, and the 13.3 uh, section of the Federal Reserve Act says that a loan has to be secured to the satisfaction of the Reserve Bank. How did you go about defining what secured to the satisfaction meant, given that this hadn't been used very much in the last 75 years? Well, uh, so there was a lot of soul searching about, uh, about that, and we finally decided in the end that the best way to figure it out is just to go ask the Rolling Stones what would make them satisfied. <laughs> 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 That, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so there, you know, secured to the satisfaction is is obviously a bit amorphous. Um, but the thirteen three and ten B, the two authorities we used most for lending, both have that standard, and they both um, are prime. They are in, te in exclusively lending authority. So, you know, the, the Fed had a long history of lending, and, and I think it always understood that as lender of last resort, it was not to provide capital, it was not providing grants, it was providing funds with the uh, expectation of repayment of those funds. So looking at collateral then becomes a, an exercise in deciding whether you feel secure enough that you're going to be repaid for the funds that you've been, uh, that you've uh, lent to the organization. And you know, we had, uh, through the discount window, a long tradition of lending and evaluating collateral and applying haircuts to uh, the valuations to decide what amount of collateral would be appropriate for, um, for that kind of credit. And we've applied a similar kind of standard to uh, the non-banking side. So were we reasonably expecting to be repaid uh, in, in the credit? I think that's the right standard. I think that what's different for securities firms co compared to commercial banks in terms of discount window lending is if you're an insured depository institution, you probably have plenty of collateral. 
because a whole portion of your balance sheet doesn't doesn't have to be collateralized. That's the the the, the, the part that's insured by de, uh, de, de, de deposit insurance. So for security firms, it's a lot lot different. Collateral actually can be quite scarce. And one thing that you know happened in the crisis that wasn't commented on very much in in in, in the valuation was the collateral. Oftentimes was in the wrong place. And it wasn't often easy to move the collateral to the right place or to get a, 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 a appropriate claim on that collateral. And a lot of this was the fact that the firms themselves had very, very poor uh, uh, data systems. Uh, they were very complex in terms of corporate form. And so it, it wasn't just a question of did the firm have enough collateral or not have enough collateral. It was also could they move the collateral to the places where they needed to move the collateral to actually secure the loans. I think that's actually a really important point because when you look at a balance sheet of a bank, you can get a sense of how much uh, it can borrow from looking at its assets because the deposits are not securing those, uh, are not secured by those assets. But with a broker dealer, since they're using their assets actively to raise funding all the time, they aren't going to have the level of collateral that's unencumbered. Uh, they have plenty of assets, perhaps, but you, they're using them actively. So. Well, that's going to become a problem if you get your dream here and then we can lend our last resort to broker-dealers, right? Maybe, maybe not. It, it depends on the regulatory scheme that goes along with having access to the, uh, the discount window. You could, you could require certain amounts of liquidity, capital, and unencumbered assets. Right. And you could and you could require through the supervisory practice that they actually know what their know where it is, know where their collateral no, is, and have the ability to mobilize that collateral right. in a timely basis. Over the final weekend at the Fed, when we were parsing through Lehman's balance sheet, uh, which was a roughly six hundred billion dollar balance sheet, the hole that we were sort of assigning to Wall Street to fill was some thirty billion dollars, and the idea was that the the assets that were left that were that were free to be pledged. Um, uh, were, I guess one standard to think about was were they worth more or less than the amount that you were trying to borrow against them? And in the case of Lehman, there were assets that it, at one point had been worth $50 billion that were now, arguably the market was saying, was worth $30 billion. And would somebody lend $30 billion or $20 billion against them? And certainly not 50 So this notion of what's enough collateral sometimes is a function of what's the value of the collateral. But that was that was the... The, the leftover toxic assets on Lehman's balance sheet that ultimately we couldn't find some other party to lend to. Um, Steve, is there any, I, I know autos is a bit awkward to put into this conversation and, and it, was, it began in the, in the Bush administration was finished by the Obama administration, but are there any lessons about the auto industry bailout that we should take away? Do we even, how do we, what criteria do we use to judge whether that was a success or not? Well, I, that's a tough one. Um, I think of the auto bailout as is sort of there were there were three pieces to it that I guess I would at least organize my thoughts around. First, there was assisting the auto finance companies, which were central to the uh, car makers, but looked at as a finance person, they're just like any other financial institution. And so once the decision was made, they, their their balance sheets resembled that of of. Uh, they were more like a bank than a car company. And, and so there was a decision taken to include them in the sort of the CPP-like assistance that we gave to other financial institutions. As far as the government's decision to aid an industrial business, whether it's a car maker or a steel maker or something like that down the road, I think that's really outside the purview of, of what um, we saw as our central mission, although I, I can't help but note that it was probably the most popular thing that happened in the eyes of the public. <laughs> Even though, <laughs> even though it lost money, it unlike lost money. the banks. So maybe there's some, some logic in that. Maybe if we'd lost, maybe money, if you'd lost more maybe money on the banks, banks it'd be more popular. Like yeah. More. yeah, that's, that's really good thinking. <laughs> um, no, and I, and I think the other thing that was unique that I, just a small footnote, at least, the, the Chrysler Financial was a particularly uh, odd thing because it was owned by a private equity firm. And the interplay that the, the Obama administration dealt with, you know, whether to save Chrysler or not, we didn't have the time to sort of have those debates, but we were trying to sort through. We, we, in order to keep the car companies alive for the next administration, uh, Chrysler Financial was there, and, and, and uh, Cerberus was negotiating hard for their, their own economic interest, and it was kind of an odd situation to be a government servant uh, in what felt like any other commercial negotiation. Uh, 
dealing with, with them. But it's a footnote, I think, to the larger public policy issues. There's a question from the, <coughs> excuse me, from the audience. Um, the Exchange Stabilization Fund was created by Congress expressly for the purpose of, as the name implies, uh, foreign exchange and U.S. dollar stability. So while it's nice that the Treasury Secretary has this slush fund he can use for whatever purpose he wants, is it really um, legit to say, oh, this was for the money market funds and we, it's a tragedy that that power was taken away? Well, I, I'm looking at Bob Hoyt, who uh, rendered the judgment to us that <laughs> <laughs> uh, it could be used for such a thing. I, I think con the, the, the rules are the rules. They were drafted the way they were drafted, and, it, and uh, the stability of I, – I, I look at exchange stabilization. Stabilizing the dollar is essential to anything we were trying to do, and so I don't, exactly. I don't see our actions at all inconsistent with – uh, what the fund, what the, the letter of, of what the fund's uh, enabling uh, legislation said. You guys have your lights on because you want to say something or just have your lights on? So I agree with what Steve said. I think that, uh, you know, particularly as the financial system grows in, in internationally and becomes much more integrated, the dollar and, and uh, the effect on foreign markets is going to be much more significant from troubles in the United States. So I think actually it's not hard to draw the conclusions, the, the exchange stabilization fund as it's written right now, um, or as it was written at the time of the crisis, I should say, um, uh, could serve that purpose. So, uh, and any tool that you have is a useful tool. Uh, otherwise, you know, if you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, and that just doesn't work. Not everything is a nail in the, uh, in the crisis. Bill, you made the point, um, a good one, I think, that while we've made some progress on resolution, one of the things we learned during the crisis is that these things spread pretty quickly from one country to another, particularly when we have global financial institutions. Lehman was one example, but of course, not the only one. Um, so how much should I worry about the fact that we've made not very much progress on how to resolve the collapse of a financial institution that sprawls across borders? Well, I I don't want to. I don't want to overstate that. I mean, I think. No, go ahead. Have, You're not have, at the Fed anymore. You can <laughs> overstate. We have. We have had. We have made some progress. I mean, there actually are tripartite exercises that where people are actually talking about what the responsibilities are. And every time we we've, we've done those, we've learned new things that we hadn't thought about before that we need to address. But you know, I think when you say tripartite, what do you mean? You know, like ECB, UK, uh, Bank, Bank of England, England and the uh, Fed, Federal Reserve. So those there's been discussions like that that I think are helpful to try to sort out what's supposed to happen. But you know, one, one example of what's interesting about those discussions is who's going to be the spokesman when you have a financial crisis? It's probably going to be the finance ministry. When, when are they going to be drawn into the conversation? Probably very late. So even that's like a, a, a shows you some of the problems are in terms of responding to a crisis. So look, I think, we're, I think we're in a better place than we were before. But until you actually do it, everyone's going to run. You know, the first time, the next time we get into the situation, people are going to run because the, one of the fundamental issues that are out there is the cost of running is really low. And so if you have any sense that there, it could go badly, you're going to run. And so until we pull this off well, it's going to be hard to imagine that the first time is going to go very smoothly. See, Dudley calls for collapse of major international finance systems so we can get more <laughs> practice. <laughs> How about a minor collapse? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, maybe a, a Luxembourg bank. Um, Scott, one of the, this is directed to you. I'm not sure you should be the only one that has to answer it. What was the thinking about setting up Title II of Dodd-Frank to resolve financial institutions as opposed to just altering bankruptcy procedures so we didn't need to involve the government so much? Uh, so the the advantage of Title II over bankruptcy is is multiple. One, uh, the the clearest advantage is there's a uh, source of funding that's guaranteed for the uh, for the resolution. That I'm not sure how you could change the bankruptcy code in a way that would make that happen, other than you know because you would be giving the funding over to uh, a band of creditors to decide how that funding would be distributed. That, that, that creates its own sort of problems. Um, it also, I think, um, uh, creates the idea that instead of just worrying about the uh, repayment of creditors, uh, 
you, you worry about financial stability. And again, I go back to, I'm not sure how the mechanism and structure of bankruptcy would uh, allow that particular group, creditors and even with court supervision, um, to take into account financial stability. Their incentives are not to take care of financial stability. The incentives of the creditors are to take care of the creditors. So uh, there may be ways that, um, that bankruptcy can be improved. I, I think that there, there's a lot of people thinking about that, and I, I wouldn't say that we shouldn't continue to try to work on uh, improving bankruptcy to help in a financial crisis. But I think the, the, central, uh, the, the central core of Title II is really something that doesn't transplant easily into the bankruptcy code. Um, in both the Lehman case and the AIG case, one of the big problems was derivatives and how extensively they were held and how hard it was to resolve them and who got stuck with the losses and all that. Have we? Is that a problem we've put behind us or does that remain something we have, despite the central clearing, have yet to address fully? Well, we've done a couple things on derivatives that I think are positive. One, central clearing of derivatives is very helpful because you, you replace a lot of bilateral risks with, with risks to the central clearinghouse. Uh, and there are tools to support the clearinghouse through lender of last resort. So I think that's very, very good. We're working on the closeout of derivatives problem. That's the one that we sort of have to solve. And is just working on that, but it hasn't really been resolved. The closeout of derivatives problem is if, if, if a firm goes into bankruptcy and fails, People have the right to close out the derivatives trades if they want to, and so they close out the ones that are advantageous to them, and they leave the ones in place that are disadvantageous to them, and that creates a huge amount of turmoil uh, in the market, and that was one of the mo most disruptive aspects of Lehman's failure. So we got to finish the task of, of managing so, so, so that if there is a Title II resolution that the derivatives book just moves into the new recapitalized uh, 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 company. Uh, without being without triggering the, the, the close out and I think I, you know, I think that's going to be done I think I think we're going to make it to that point but we haven't quite got there yet Do you want to add to all right well that um, I'm going to join me in thanking this panel and introducing the next one thanks for watching be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings